All right, we might as well jump right in. Welcome everybody. You've joined us for the Navigating the Confusing Array of Digital Learning Definitions webinar. My name is Megan Raymond. I lead programs, sponsorship, and membership here at WCET. If this is your first WCET event, reach out and I'd love to tell you more about us. As we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to those questions. If you put them in the chat, they tend to get lost. So do use the Q&A for the questions and then chat to engage in the conversation. The slides and resources will be emailed to all the registrants next week, and you can download the slides by accessing the link in the chat. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel, so if you want to follow along, you can even post questions there. That hashtag is WCET webcast. Again, if you have any questions, we'll hold those till the end unless there's one that we feel like we need to stop and, and address right away. We have a wonderful moderator today, a great friend and generous servant of WCET, Dr. Shannon Riggs, who's the Executive Director of Academic Programs and Learning Innovation at Oregon State University eCampus. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And um, I uh, serve as Executive Director for Oregon State University's uh, eCampus and as the Chair for the Steering Committee for WCET this year. So I'm very pleased to, to be here with you today. Um, today, we are going to be talking about um, a study and some modality definitions. And of course, uh, the pandemic opened up so many um, modalities and combinations of modalities um, uh, for, for our faculty, staff, and students to, to manage, um, that it, it became kind of, um, kind of confusing, or there was just a lot to keep, keep track of. And, um, the steering committee for our conversations, um, always supporting students, preparing faculty, planning for technology and the policy creation and the revision and updates that need to come about really rely so heavily on the, on how we are defining these terms. Um, and, uh, and we just knew that we, we were curious about whether we had some consensus around definitions um, you know, um, nationally. And so we knew that we needed data. And so Russ Poulin, the executive director for WCET, uh, connected us with today's speakers, Dr. Nicole Johnson and Dr. Jeff Seaman. And what came out of that connection is what we're here to share with you today. Um, the study that was conducted and the survey um, that was conducted was based upon a previous study done by today's presenters in Canada titled The Growth of Online Learning and Digital Learning Resources in Canadian Post-Secondary Education. So I am pleased today to introduce you to introduce um, um, the authors of this study um, and our speakers today. Dr. Nicole Johnson is the Executive Director of the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association, where she leads annual longitudinal research studies exploring pan-Canadian trends related to digital learning at post-secondary institutions. She also has an independent research and consulting practice and works on research teams at Royal Words. Rhodes University in Victoria, BC, and Bayview Analytics in Oakland, California. Her primary research interests include tracking macro-level trends in digital learning at the post-secondary level, defining and operationalizing key terms associated with digital learning, investigating faculty experiences with technology, exploring the future of higher education, and better understanding how adults learn informally in digital contexts. Dr. Jeff Seaman is the director of Bayview Analytics. He has worked in education information technology for over 20 years. Dr. Seaman created and ran the Computing Resource Center and served as associate Vi vice provost for computing for the University of Pennsylvania and as chief information officer for Lesley University. Dr. Seaman um, has been conducting research in the impact of technology on higher education and K-12 beginning with comprehensive national studies of technology use in U.S. higher education. He has served on um, academic technology advisory boards for a number of information technology companies, including Apple Computer, IBM, and Microsoft. Um, and Cheryl Dowd is also here um, from WCET, is the Senior Director of the State Authorization Network and WCET Policy um, Innovations. She joined WCET in August of 2015 as the director of the State Authorization Network and currently serves as director of uh, senior director of policy innovations. 
She directs the overall activities of WCEP's state authorization network, including coordination of staff addressing interstate policy and compliance, along with other ancillary compliance issues. As Senior Director, Cheryl also serves the overall WCET membership in addressing emergency and special regulatory issues related to digital learning and post-secondary education. She brings extensive experience in education and compliance to the WCET team and is a contributing author for State Authorization of Colleges and Universities, a guidebook for understanding the legal basis for state and federal compliance for activities of post-secondary inst institutions. What an esteemed panel we have for you today. So I'm so glad to um, um, have you all here with them and I will turn, um, turn the presentation over to them at this point. Thank you. And thank you for the very generous introductions. Uh, first, I'd like to make sure everybody understands the wide range of organizations who are part of this effort. Um, this would not be possible without all of these organizations doing their part. The, we have collected data in, in the US across a wide range of institutions. We'll, I'll give you the counts and things in a second, um, which was done in two different ways, but each of these organizations had a, an important part of it. And I also like to give another call out to WCET. I've been working with WCET uh, for a number of years on a number of projects, and it always has been a very productive and enjoyable experience. This is no different. This, um, so would like to make sure that we understand not, not just the, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association, WCET and Bayview Analytics, who were the core of this, but OLC um, actually did a lot of the outreach piece, and I will put, be putting a um, a link in the chat in a minute. Um, they're also the public that we published a report of the outcome here in their online learning journal. Quality Matters and OPSEA also were critical in this. So these organizations were very useful and helpful in us in designing the project, but also critical in getting the word out and getting multiple types of responses from all over the higher ed universe. Uh, next slide, please. So what we have um, is, we'll be giving you is information that we got from 987 faculty and a bit over a thousand administrators. Um, these come from 870 different institutions. They represent the entire geographic coverage of the US. Um, and it comes from two different approaches. Um, and this is critical for what we want. We want to make sure that no matter how we found the data and where we went, that what we were finding was consistent. So we did a primary example, which is using mailing lists, commercial sources of mailing lists uh, exist for academic administrators and for teaching faculty. And then we also had um, the same survey being sent out by multiple other, by WCET, by OLC, Quality Matters, and OPSEA, and were able to take data from all five of these pieces, combine them, confirm that the results were consistent across every single group and then pull, so that we could pull the results here and to show you this that is um, surprising in terms of how consistent and how um, I'll let Nicole show you the uh, really important findings here and how pieces of, of this but to also understand for this um, we don't know who each respondent is. The first thing we do is remove all of the personal identifying information. So what we do know is what institution they come from, and we've used that in the analysis. Um, so with that, I'll pass it on to Nicole and put the link in the side so you can see the other article about this. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, so I want to actually start with a starting point um, with the question that might be being asked right now, like, you know, who are you to come up with definitions? Um, because institutions have different definitions, different people hold different definitions. So I thought as I was planning this, the good starting point would be is, you know, how on earth did we come up with these definitions? Why did we decide to attach, you know, these definitions to these terms? One of the issues that we were having in the Canadian context um, 
is we were looking at tracking online enrollments. And Canada is a bit different from the US in the sense that education is provincially mandated and provincially run. So it's not, we don't have a federal education system like the US. And one of the things that was happening is um, really um, there was a lot of inconsistency between provinces and even between institutions in terms of what they were calling their courses um, and what that actually meant. So that made, of course, when we asked how many, you know, enrollments do you have, you know, online enrollments, well, if two institutions have completely different definitions of what online learning is, we're not going to get data that is useful comparative data. So what we did is to solve this, we asked institutions in Canada to tell us their definitions. So we started with qualitative research and we said, okay, do you have an institutional definition for online learning? And some did, some didn't. Um, and the ones that did tell us what that definition is. And we took the whole range of responses and we looked for common characteristics within those definitions. And that's how we came up with these definitions. And there was, um, we did produce a, a definitions report. Um, Jeff, if that's not linked in the chat, can you make sure that the CDLRA definitions report is? Because that does discuss and shows the different definitions that came in and how we came up with these terms. So the next step after these terms was to then, um, look at the literature and make sure that these match the literature and then start testing out these terms, which is what brought us to the current survey, which we also ran um, in Canada as well. So the results we're sharing right now are the US specific results, but there's a lot of consistency between the two countries and what we found. Um, if I can get to the next slide, please. The key finding which actually kind of <laughs> surprised uh, Jeff and I by just how high um, the levels of agreement were. Um, we we saw that actually when we put forth those definitions that were that were broader, they didn't go into the nitty gritty of a lot of things, but just kept it that online learning means that all instruction and interaction is fully online and it can be synchronous or asynchronous. And again, we saw that 91% of respondents in the U.S. agreed with that. And then when we asked about hybrid learning, meaning that it's a blend of online and in-person instruction, um, again, we saw 95% agreement. So the key thing here, um, because I will talk in a moment a little bit about the agreement or the disagreement that we saw and the reasons that were given for disagreement, but I want to frame that in the context of that that slice of disagreement was very, very small. For the most part, the vast majority of the respondents uh, reported that they agreed with the definitions that we put forth. So if I can get um, the next slide, please. Okay, so the key findings from the study, again, was that there was widespread agreement with the survey definitions. And the disagreement that we saw, it didn't give us it didn't indicate a need to modify the survey definitions. So within that small slice of disagreement, um, for example, for online and hybrid learning, sometimes people held more granular definitions or they wanted much more broad definitions for these terms. Um, you know, there was the odd one that, you know, would say like, oh, no, it, you know, online learning is only asynchronous learning or it, should only be synchronous learning or things like that. So that's the sort of things that we were seeing in the definition or in the disagreement. And even in the disagreement too, there were a few responses where uh, they gave their, what they, how they would define it instead. And their definition was in many ways actually very consistent with the definition we put forth. There, we weren't sure where the point of contention was. And that's all outlined, um, that is described in a lot of detail in the uh, journal article that I believe that uh, was just put into the chat. Um, so if you're interested in more of that detail, that's there. What we did find though, is that there's a lot of variation in describing course offerings at the institutional level. So we took these and we, we understand that institutions can't 
just go ahead and change what they're calling things, right? We need to actually meet institutions where we're at. We need to, when we're having conversations with colleagues, be able to have conversations where we're not trying, you know, where the point of the conversation ends up getting lost because it turns into a debate on what we should call things. Um, so the findings do highlight a need for these big bucket approaches. So these terms that actually we can all agree that online learning means that all the learning takes place in an online context, that hybrid learning means a mix of online and in-person instruction. And that's what drove the modes of learning spectrum. Thank you for the slide change. Um, so before we open it up to discussion, I just wanted to talk a bit about this in more detail, because this is how we took these findings and put it in a way that makes sense, that can give some common language to how we describe the different offerings that are taking place at institutions. So each of the colored squares represents what we call a big bucket. So these big bucket definitions. Um, and so if you notice, we go from sort of two extremes. So in the darker orange, you see that there's in-person non-digital learning. So all classes take place on campus and there's no technology or digital resources required to complete coursework. And that would be very unusual and rare in this day and age. On the other extreme of the spectrum, we see offline distance learning. And that would be where all instruction is done by correspondence that does not use internet technologies. So for instance, print resources are sent by mail or VHS or DVDs are sent in the mail. Um, again, that is very, very rare and unusual in this day and age. Most of what we see in the current post-secondary uh, post education state happens in the three middle categories, the in-person technology supported learning, the hybrid learning, and the online learning. And you'll notice that we put the dividing line between in-person learning and uh, distance learning uh, right through hybrid learning, and that's because hybrid involves a mix of both. Um, and so what we did is you'll see then in each of those big bucket categories, particularly online learning and hybrid learning, there's a bunch of little terms there like synchronous online, self-paced asynchronous, combined synchronous and asynchronous. Those are described being the variations that can exist within the bucket of online learning. So what we're saying is, you know, one institution can say, yeah, online, you know, the, all the online courses we offer are um, asynchronous online. We don't offer a synchronous option. And we can say, especially for those of us who work in research and data gathering or even in policy and say, okay, then that's right. That's online learning and, you know, describe the course. Well, we have, you know, students can choose between, um, they can choose between attending the online course. It's all online, but they can choose between attending, you know, live Zoom sessions, or they can just watch the recording afterwards. And we would say, okay, that also falls into the big bucket of online learning. We can check that box because there is no in-person requirement, even though it's a mix of uh, synchronous, asynchronous, and the student can choose. Um, we see the same thing with hybrid learning. And again, we see there's different variations. It could be flipped classroom. We could see high flex learning, and I'll come back to that in a minute. We could see in um, online instruction, but that there is some sort of required in-person component, like a practicum or an intensive. And for that big bucket definition, we would consider all those things hybrid learning because there's some piece of online there and there's some piece of um, in-person there. There's two sort of distinctions here that we want to talk about because there's two ways that this can go. It can be in hybrid learning, instructor prescribed, or it can be student led, like we see in the case of high flex learning. For so, so for example, something like a flipped classroom would likely be instructor prescribed or in a, another hybrid environment, an instructor prescribed environment would be that, okay, well, we're, you know, you know, we meet in person on Mondays and Wednesdays, and then our Friday class is online, or there's a lesson that you have to watch online, but it's the instructor or, you know, the instructional designer, the, the institution who makes that choice for the students and the students are expected to follow that. Um, we also, on the high flex or the multi-access hybrid we see, um, that's where it's student's choice. So it's still hybrid because the options exist for the student to be able to switch 
from online or in person at their choice. It's just not instructor prescribed. So it's in a hybrid com context where it's student led. A student actually may decide to go in person that whole semester, but we still put it in the hybrid category because the course as a whole allows for some students to be online and some to be in person. Um, we don't put it as high flex or, or hybrid if it's the students have to select um, a section. We saw that in a bit of the results. So if the students are having to select in advance that, okay, there's, there's a course, I want to take it, but I have to pick either an online section of the course or an in-person section of the course, that's neither hybrid or high flex. That's online learning for one section and in-person learning for another. And just to kind of close it, the, you know, it's not necessarily cut and dry. This is still emerging. We work to create a framework where new um, emergent modes of learning could be put in as variations. So this isn't at all an exhaustive um, list, but we do want to say that the biggest area of contention comes between that line between hybrid learning and in-person technology supported learning, particularly as more technologies come into the classroom. So in in-person technology supported learning, all classes take place on campus, but technology is used in teaching and learning and there are digital resources used. Students might be using open educational resources that are online. They might be using um, you know, online homework systems. Um, they may be interacting with their peers between classes on online platforms or through the LMS. Um, but the classes themselves take place on campus. And that's an area where more research is needed and more, you know, in-depth understanding is needed is where does that line, you know, where does in-person technology supported and, and hybrid begin? Um, and that line, especially during the pandemic, has become increasingly blurred for sure. Um, so with that said, I think that that's all I have to say on this. And I think Jeff and I would love to love to answer questions. We love talking about this. All right, any questions can go in the um, in the Q and A. Uh, we have a question from uh, Janine Lim. What do you see as the next effort? Okay, so like the next research effort, um, that's what I'm I'm guessing is the question there. Oh, that's a good question. Maybe I'll speak to that and I'll push it over to Jeff too, because we've had a few conversations about this is, you know, where, where does this go next? I think, you know, now that we've put this forth, um, one of the areas I think that there's a need to see is um, looking again at what's happening on the ground, um, what's happening at the faculty level in particular, because we we see what's happening at the institutional level and how courses are coded. Um, it would be great to check if there's some, there's, you know, the consistencies there with um, how a course is being coded or, you know, put forth to students and then what the student experience actually is. Uh, so I think that there's there. We also see themes within professional development too. When we talk about modes of learning, um, it's a bit different from the defining part, but then, you know, faculty training for different modes of learning certainly is um, always been an ongoing um, issue, especially with that demand. But I would say one of the key things we see is that we see there's a need for students to know what they're taking and students are wanting more and more to know what the expectations of them are in a course for where they need to be, what technologies they need to have. So I would say that there's certainly um, the next you know, there'd be a good case for an effort to look at the difference between, um, if there are a difference between how courses are co coded and how they're implemented. Jeff, I'm sure you have more to add to that. Um, I'd add a couple of things here that in terms of where we'd want to go for this. Um, there's some other results we've had. So this is um, the link to the previous uh, report that Nicole authored um, is actually built on a number of years of data that we collected in Canada on this. And one of the things that we found is um, that even institutions that have a lot of agreement on a particular definition often have more than one definition. And they have more than one definition for multiple reasons. 
Sometimes it's because of reporting requirements that they have for different organizations. Sometimes, and uh, we've heard this in some of the comments and I've seen this in some, um, that they have a technical definition they use for the technology, the teaching and learning people, a different definition they use for the faculty, and yet a different wording of that definition when they communicate with students. Um, and I think that's a really important part to, to start looking at this is that as the ultimate consumer of all of this, what are you telling students? And what's the student view of these definitions? Um, we've been doing a lot of research in the US on students and pieces, not on exactly these questions, but on questions about their approach and uh, attitudes towards blended courses, hybrid courses, online courses. And we see a huge amount of change in that post pandemic. And uh, um, so I'm thinking that whatever institutional perceptions were of what student expectations were pre-pandemic, they better recalibrate now and going forward. So I think that's a critical piece for us to start looking into. Thank you. I'd love to bring Cheryl um, a little more into this conversation. Um, Cheryl, can you speak a little bit about what this means for institutional policies? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and before I get started, I just want to say I'm subbing in for Russ today, and I know he would want to thank uh, Jeff and Nicole and Shannon uh, for the development of this webinar, and certainly to Nicole and Jeff in regard to the development of this survey and the results of the survey. It's, it's a very rich piece of information for which WCET is very invested in this work and will be following up with, um, we have a paper uh, that's close to completion about the various definitions that are already provided within different agencies, federal and state agencies that show that there are some you know, different ways and different viewpoints as well as talking about the student view. So we'll be talking about that shortly um, within WCET. But from a policy standpoint, I think the thing that comes to mind to me, especially after reviewing the results of the survey, is that there is some consensus around some of the definitions in terms of what the definition said, but maybe not so much in terms of what the implementation is. So to Jeff's point about the student perspective, I think that is very important because we wanna talk about, and you know, this is my lens, is student consumer protection. And so if you're getting into the standpoint where the student believes that they are taking a course in a certain structure, but it's actually in a different structure when it actually is happening and it causes a student to need additional technology to be available at different times, et cetera, you're gonna start seeing some uh, concerns and perhaps some uh, regulations that could be occurring as well. Because as we know, um, technology and innovation is always ahead of the law. So we could see state and Department of Ed regulations and laws uh, coming forward that would want to have more specificity about supporting the students so that they're made aware of the transparency of the issues of um, what type of modality that they are actually signing up for. So that's going to be really key down the road. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the in the Q and A area about um, an alignment or perhaps lack of alignment with the U.S. federal definitions. I'm wondering if that was if there was any consideration given to that, or if you have any um, any thoughts or reflections on that. Jeff, as the American in the room, I think I'm going to divert that question to you. I'm, I was meeting the Canadian in the room, and you you're much more familiar with the American context than I am. Um. Yeah, and it, it actually there's, you said it's singular and it isn't singular. There are multiple definitions with mul multiple people you need to be dealing with. Um, we, this particular research was um, aimed not at official definitions for reporting, but at what people called it and what people used in their conversations and what people used to communicate to each other. Um, we do, and in fact, I, I think the, the teaser you just heard from some of the WCET efforts going forward is, is that there are different regional um, accrediting organizations have different definitions. States have different definitions. And in fact, in many states, the definitions differ by what kind of institution you are in reporting back. Um, and there is a federal definition for IPEDS data reporting as well, but it's not the only federal definition you have. And so um, this is 
going to be pretty critical in terms of there is no easy answer. This is not going to go away. There's not going to be a single definition out of the, coming out of all of this. Um, and I think one of our, uh, I have two con conclusions about this. Um, and I don't know if Nicole agrees completely on this. One is I absolutely agree that we need this sort of big bucket approach because the more we get into the fine differences, the less we actually communicate. And two is we're going to have to learn to live with these differences. I mean, whatever we're doing here, we can highlight where they are different and where we're doing, but we need to say, all right, what do we communicate to students? What do we communicate to, as an expectation to a faculty member based on what we call something and, and going forward? So absolutely, we include in our list of what went into this, what, how do we do definitions, what definitions do we give to people? We include the things coming from the federal government, from state governments and pieces, but they're just one of many. And um, as I mentioned earlier, most institutions have we have have very indefinite definitions, even within their own de their own institution, often driven by those competing needs. Thank you. Um, you know, there's another question in the in the Q and A area from uh, Karen Bell Bellmuir. <clears throat> She's wondering if you've seen examples of definitions that effectively balance pedagogical flexibility and clarity for students on like the times and places that they're expected. Yeah, and I think that's where institutions play a role um, in terms of how they're describing their courses and those variations. I think there's there's sort of two parts here. There's the big bucket definition so that we can agree that, okay, this is you know, in essence, online learning. This is, in essence, hybrid learning. And then there's what the institution is calling it, um, you know, and how the institution is describing it and saying, okay, so this is, you know, this hybrid course is, you know, means that you have to, you know, you have to show up online on this day and you have to do this piece of it, or you have to show up in person this day, you have to do this piece of it online. And so far it's, in, it's instructor prescribed. They're saying that, you know, this is a high flex course in which you've got those choices. Um, I did notice because I was looking in the, the chat briefly too, and I do want to touch on a couple of things um, that were there too that kind of fit into this with the, it, it's tricky because this is where those variations come in and the variations actually provide a lot of benefit in describing the experience for students, the nature of the teaching that they'll receive, the nature of the experience for them. Um, and in there, you know, um, I did note that there was someone who, you know, had said, you know, is hybrid student choice. Hi hybrid is not necessarily student choice. It can be student choice. It also can be instructor prescribed if it's got that mix between the two. Um, the, the high flex is in Brian Beattie's definition stands for hybrid flexible learning. And that describes in many ways how the student is going to experience the course. Um, in terms of pedagogy, we have to be careful, and this again, I guess, speaks to the earlier question about research efforts. We have to be careful not to get so granular in how we're describing things at the, you know, at the overarching level that again, we lose our ability to, to communicate with each other about the core characteristics that we're so firm on what our definitions are. Um, that do that. I think there's also further research needed on, you know, students, how students define these and which was talked about before. Jeff, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I had to find the unmute button there. Uh, 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 no, I agree completely. I think that all of this, uh, the variability that we're seeing in all of this is, it's, it's a nature of the beast. It's something we're going to have to consider going oh, always going forward. And it it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the surprising part out of all of this is if you give people a core piece of it, 90 to 95 percent of people will agree completely. So what we need to the biggest takeaway from here is there's a core set of agreement of what on the broadest possible level of what these things mean and that the subtleties behind that are 
are important for different reasons, but are not the thing that should make the difference between and drive and create an argument. It's better to, to just go past that. Thanks. You know, the, um, the high flex concept is interesting. Um, and I think what's appealing about that to many is the just that flexibility that allows students to kind of come and go as they're able to please and it um, and as they please and it just seems to improve access, um, you know, for a variety of circumstances. But one of our um, attendees has posed a question um, in, in the um, Q&A area about the challenge of um, all the documentation we need to do in administering education. So uh, checking schedules for international students, tracking for military and veteran students, student athletes, um, allowing students to kind of choose their modality on the fly does not always allow for such identification. So Cheryl, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts to share on this, um, this tension. Sure, and, and I think some of this is, you know, in development um, to the point that if it's high flex, we're talking about where is the activity taking place. So from my perspective, it appears to me that if it's not taking place in the state where the institution is located, then you're going to have to be concerned and track where your students are located and be in compliance with whatever kind of requirements um, are in that location. So if it's international, you know, what what are the circumstances for education in these other places? Because it is going to vary. We talked about that before about state definitions vary and state oversight varies. Um, interesting enough, the veterans, you know, we're talking about the um, state approving agency. And so something, uh, my issue would be, um, you know, you're tracking, you're communicating with the SAA um, at, if for your state um, where your institution is, um, because that SAA is going to be able to advise you about whether there's going to be something that is going to be required with your student out of state. And so the new SAA distance education regulation, my understanding is supposed to come out in October. Um, so that would be something to review there. But I think what we're talking about here is we always talk about tracking where our, our students are located and also communicating with whatever the um, entity is that would be providing oversight where that location is. Nicole and Jeff, anything else you'd like to add on that point before we move on? No, I think that that's uh, and that's a valuable point. And we see that in you know I've presented this not just you know in U.S. and Canada, but in other countries too. And I think that that's you know it's a key issue, right? Like we've I think um, you know we have to consider what each institution what like there's different there's different requirements that come in terms of reporting and what institutions need to do um, and how institutions have communicated to things to students in the past and what students know. So we sort of have to take a step back and, you know, with this, um, you know, with these definitions, these may not be what things are called at an institutional level. There is a good argument for institutions to have more granular descriptions than this. But when we're coming back and we're tracking and we're actually trying to look at macro level trends, especially when researchers are collaborating in the field, when we're, you know, comparing, you know, cross country studies, um, you know, when we're developing policy, and a lot of my work is talking to uh, different governments and using this so that they know, okay, this means this means this. So an on an online course, you know, has these characteristics, regardless of what an institution might call it or the different variations that they may implement at their institution. So I just wanted to sort of emphasize the, the points that uh, Cheryl made were, were very, very good. We have a couple of questions um, around the student perception and, and how we're bringing student voices into the, the research um, and whether um, there's one question asking about it, if you can share some current research on student perceptions in regard to instructional modalities um, or their, their preferences. Um, and then another question about um, how we might bring student voices into the, into the research as well. Any thoughts on that? I'll start. Um, it's critical. Um, we have that's been part of our sort of our research thought process from the very beginning. Um, I'll put in a, in the answer 
in the Q and a, a, a link to some other work we've been doing at, at Baby Analytics, where we run a series of pulse surveys, and the last four of which we've had, we've been asking students about one: how has their opinion changed about online versus blended versus use of digital materials, things like that, um, and what's their desire going forward? Um, and what we see is consistently that students are telling us they have a more optimistic view about all of these, these different modalities than they did pre-pandemic, and that they consistently want more of it in their future educational options. Um, there's some differences, uh, and there's some really interesting differences, and in some you might really expect um, students who have family responsibilities and work responsibilities are much more open or positive about remote kinds of activities as opposed to on-campus ones. Um, but that every group that we do is more positive now, including those who are taking only in-person courses are more positive about online and want the option of an online or hybrid course to a greater extent now than they did pre-pandemic. So we're seeing this, this change um, and it's pervasive across all of the subgroups. We look at two-year schools, four-year schools, and different majors among students. If I could just add just one little bit. Thank you, Jeff. Um, in, in regard to this, it's my understanding that as part of this project, we are going to be presenting more of the student view. And what we're learning is that students want to be um, spoken with with clarity. Um, so certainly transparency about what is the expectation for the student is going to be key. And um, that student voice, and we'll, we'll elaborate more on that um, as part of this project as we move forward. Yeah, I can share that the um, steering committee worked with Ohio State University to do a focus group with students, and there were some interesting outcomes from that. Um, it will be part of uh, some presentations in the WCET annual meeting in the fall. Um, there's a, a We have a question about seat time, which is um, an interesting um, aspect uh, of, that is often part of the hybrid or blended definition. Um, and so the question is, when we look at um, you know, on campus versus hybrid or blended, we typically thought of blended as having some reduction of on campus seat time. Um, does do any of the definitions um, make this distinction, or wh what is the place for for this quality or this trait of, of hybrid or blended education in in this conversation? In looking at Jeff on the chat and see if he wants to tackle it before me, which one? Um, it's a complex question. Um, we get this a lot, and we see this. This sort of ties into other other research areas, and it takes us into sort of that that tension point between um, you know pedagogical practices and you know, being able to meet students' needs from an instructor level and then also maximizing, you know, the number of students who can take a course. And I think that there's a very fine line um, that needs to be walked uh, between that in terms of, you know, making making those spots available, but without overloading the instructor. When we when we look at research that goes beyond, the, you know, these these definitions, but actually looks at uh, practices and you know faculty perceptions of different modes of learning and faculty concerns about those. Uh, one of the things that comes up over and over is faculty workload and concerns that uh, classes will be overloaded with students to the point that you know they're concerned that they may not be able to teach as effectively. So. I'm cognizant, you know, of yes, it can it can impact seat time, but we don't want to see, you don't want to necessarily want to view online learning or hybrid learning as a way to increase class sizes. Um, and because that ultimately puts more on the faculty member and has the potential to reduce the quality of the learning experience for the student. Another question that, that's come up is really an interesting one. Do you have any plans to map your definitions to expectations or best practices for faculty and student success? So um, um, make this a little more actionable in terms of like pedagogical approaches and teaching and learning. 
I like that question. I think that's a really good question. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that that would be a very interesting research study. Jeff, do you have anything to say on that? I love the question as well. And I immediately started thinking in terms of a researcher, what would be my sample? Who would I, what kind of question would I want to ask? What's the outcome we'd really want to know? I, I like it because of how difficult it is. We have really, higher education does not have a very good record of measuring outcomes. Um, and what, or even agreeing what the best outcome is um, uh, on these things. So it's a really messy area and to start measuring differences is even messier, which makes it the ideal research question and one which I'd be really interested in pursuing and understanding. Let's see, uh, we've got a flurry of questions here. Here's, here's one uh, from Jim Julius. I'm curious about how learning was selected as the key terminology for these definitions rather than teaching or instruction or education. Um, Jim says he likes the learner centeredness, but the definitions seem concentrated on what faculty do more so than on what students do. Yeah, this came up and um, we, we, we've, we tossed this around and thought about it a bit. Um, conventionally, people have just talked about it as online learning. Um, we want to be really careful in terms of these uh, definitions. Um, these, these are important points because, of course, you know, some of the comments that we, we get and th things that we had to consider is, you know, well, where is the learning taking place, right? So, you know, it, it brings up, you know, almost, almost philosophical points, right? Well, you know, if the, if the learn, is the learner ever learning online, if they are embodied in their, you know, in their person, right? Like they, you, you get these, is everything in person learning then because you're, 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 you know, engaging with online, but you don't physically go online. And it kind of opened up this can of worms that isn't really helpful um, when we get into it. And it leads to a lot of philosophical debates that actually detract from what we're trying to do in creating common understanding and meaning. I think it's really important um, to, to acknowledge the difference between learning and instruction on a philosophical point. I think when we're going into definitions and we're communicating with people who are outside the education sector, um, you know, for me, this makes a lot of sense because I started my career as an educator. Um, you know, I have those, you know, that the philosophy that it, what education is, what does it mean to learn? What does it mean to teach? Whereas a lot of the people that we communicate with um, who may be policymakers or who may be students haven't necessarily thought about that in those philosophical terms. And the common language that we tend to use is learning it makes sense to everyone it works we thought about switching it um but we wanted to be careful not to go too philosophical and then take away from what we were trying to do all right for this next question i'm going to ask you to bring out um your um your crystal ball or kind of look into the future a little bit <laughs> Um, as you look into the future, do you see institutions hardening definitions and restraining variety in the name of clarity for students, or do you see that hybridity and flexibility, I think we, um, we might be coining some new terms here, will mean that there's almost an endless variety of possibilities for the way that classes are scheduled, taught, and attended? I think from what we saw in the data, Jeff, I don't know. I think we could see an equal mix of both. Uh, when we saw the when we saw the disagreement with the definitions, uh, particularly with online and hybrid, it was almost a 50-50 split in terms of, and again, this is just a minor disagreement. Most people agreed, but it was like a 50-50 split on people who were like, this should be much more broad and expansive. And people who are like, you must narrow this down. This needs to be very, very granular and firm and finite. So I suspect we'll continue to see a tension between those things. And we'll see some, you know, some institutions, some faculty moving towards that shift and pushing for that shift to fluidity. And we'll see some going the exact other way and pushing for more granularity and narrowness. I don't know, Jeff, what would you, what would you say on that? Um, I 
agree with all of that. And I'd say the one positive aspect we saw out of this that might lead to a um, less definition variability is there's a great desire on the part of institutions for common definitions to have a common vocabulary to talk about. And if anything comes out of this, which evolves even a little bit in that direction, we may have less of this variability. Um, we've heard, in, and now for multiple years, um, in our questions about definitions that we've asked previously that led to this project, um, I have multiple definitions on my campus. We have them for multiple reasons. It adds burden and confusion to us. We would rather have a sim single definition and one which we could talk to our students in a, in a meaningful way, but we don't know what that is. So I, it's, we have a lot of very, the, the corresponding part of this is the variability in mode of instruction is getting greater, not narrower. And that leads to even more need or desire to have something that defines what students see, what faculty see. I thought it was a very interesting question um, I saw about, have we seen um, icons that people put in the, your college catalog to identify? Um, we have answers from many of the institutions talking about the terms they use in their catalog and that the term they use in the catalog, they try to be consistent to the student, but actually that isn't always the case. It may be consistent by program, not by the across the entire institution, and it may not match what they call it internally by faculty members. So the what's driving a lot of this is the need for clarity to communicate to faculty and the need for clarity to communicate to, to students. That drives them to have, we need something that which, is simple enough to communicate, but has the nuances that we think are critical. And at the moment, there's some coalescence going on about that, but I, I'm hopeful, but not too hopeful. I just have one comment to add to that, because I think what Jeff and Nicole were sharing is so important. And I think that the recommendations that came out of the paper about this big bucket idea, I think that's brilliant because if you're able to put them in buckets, it also provides for clarification and transparency to students. And I think what could be a driver in terms of what the variation could be were other um, qualifications that and requirements that come from state and from the Department of Ed and maybe Veterans Affairs and anyone else who is overseeing the um, curriculum um, and the, the uh, quality. So we could have accreditors um, putting more, um, more of a house around the variety of definitions. So that could happen, I think, in the future that would help um, streamline, you know, what the types are for purposes of transparency to the student. But in this big bucket way, it could provide those variations, as Jeff said, you know, of the nuances within, as long as there's clarity and transparency to the student about what their expectation should be to participate in the course. I think we've probably got time for another one or two questions. Um, let's see. What about from the faculty perspective? There was a question about um, faculty wanting some flexibility in, in high flex kind of situations for personal or for other, other kinds of reasons. Um, any thoughts on, I mean, we, we talk about this a lot in terms of what the, the student access and their you know, student access to education any thoughts on implications for faculty and their, their um, modes of access to, to instruction? Um, just to say that I think in the research that we see that there certainly is a faculty interest in having more flexibility. We've seen that in both Canada and I think we've seen that as well. Uh, Jeff, you can correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think we've seen that in the US as well. Whereas uh, faculty are wanting more flexibility in how they teach their courses, just like we're seeing that among students. Uh, they, they want, you know, faculty have competing life demands as well. They've got kids to raise, they've got things. And especially, you know, in whatever context that, you know, we're in this still in pandemic, post pandemic, but, you know, in a context where still, you know, a child might test positive for COVID and then you've you've got to be home with them and you can't send them to daycare. What do you do? You know, we see, we see that 
the same um, challenges that faculty face compared to students who, you know, that work-life balance. Um, and Jeff, do you have anything else in the work that you've done that would add to that? Yeah, um, the same, uh, the Pulse Service, as mentioned before, we, um, we have seen exactly the same pattern of responses from faculty as we saw from students. Much more optimistic about um, online, hybrid, digital materials than they were before. Much more optimistic about using technology in their courses. Even those faculty who don't teach anything other than in-person courses and a strong desire on the part of the faculty to teach more courses in a hybrid and fully online. The one interesting thing that we see is that there's a slight difference that students and faculty, when we ask about personal preferences and what they want to do going forward, both of those groups are give a higher rating of a much like have the option for teaching fully online with hybrid and mixed modes slightly below. When we ask administrators, those two get changed. Administrators are most likely looking forward and planning programs that are hybrid and mixed mode with, with online just slightly below that. So there's a slight disconnect between what students and faculty are saying and what we're hearing from administrators. All three groups are much more positive about this and believe that they need more variability and more choice on the part of faculty members. And administrators say they recognize that faculty want more choice. Overwhelmingly, they tell us they recognize that faculty want more choice in how they teach. A related question. Um, did anyone in the survey share concerns about how the variability in modes might impact uh, state decisions or institutional decisions about um, um, access to physical space? So if we move, if we shift to more um, online or hybrid kinds of modalities, are we going to give up the spaces <laughs> that can be so hard to get in some places? Mm -hmm. I don't know that we saw that in this particular study. We didn't have that expressed as a concern in our uh, qualitative, uh, the qualitative aspects of this survey, but um, that's not to say that that hasn't come up in other places. So maybe I'll uh, look to both Jeff and Cheryl to see if they've heard that. Uh, I would just say for our positive reading of the comments and feedback here, I've not seen that as raised as an issue. Maybe one comment out of hundreds and hundreds, but it's not a pattern we've been seeing. All right, last question. Um, what do you think should be the biggest impact of your study results? That's a great question. Um, I think we we've been amazed even in the Can Canadian side since we launched this since we we since we asked those questions about definitions and we put out this you know quick you know definitions report in Canada the the life that that's taken on has actually been incredibly surprising the impact that it's had, that we've seen and that we expect this to have will be adding that clarity for decision makers um I don't know that this will be a report that you know, faculty will sit in their hands and be like, oh, it's this. It would be, it would be great if it gives that clarity for it to say like, oh, my course actually seems more hybrid than it does in person based on these characteristics. But we're seeing it at the policy levels, um, at, gover um, at government levels um, in several countries. We're seeing that at, you know, in terms of institutional governance. When we're seeing institutions wanting to have this common definition to be more cohesive, you know, across departments and across programs and how they communicate what it is they offer. So I think that's, and that's what I hope is the impact is that it starts offering clarity and it's not going to happen overnight and it's not necessarily going to change what things are called, but it will impact our understanding of what it means when someone says, oh yes, we offer this, um, you know, you can say, oh, tell me about the characteristics, what, you know, you're understanding that it's a variation rather than arguing, well, that's not online, right? You're saying, ah, oh, their variation on online is this, our variation is this, we call it different things, but they both fit in this big bucket and it, it leads to more consensus going forward. Thank you so much. Uh, Megan, please um, close us out. Great. Well, thank you so much. I just really want to acknowledge Shannon, Nicole, Jeff, and Cheryl. Thank you so much for your, the, the discussion today. We had very active and engaged participation. So 
check back. We'll also share the link to the, the recording and any resources that were shared. Visit our website. We have several new webcasts coming up. And then be sure to join us at the annual meeting. If you haven't already made travel plans, join us to be face-to-face -face in Denver. We're excited to see people again. And I want to quickly acknowledge our sponsors and partners that help underwrite much of our events here at WCET, as well as our supporting members. And we'd like to welcome the University of Arizona who just joined as supporting members. So again, thank you, everybody. Be well, and we hope to see you in Denver.